Hello again. In this video, I'm going to talk about the Salisbury Convention, or perhaps more accurately put, the Salisbury Addison Convention. This convention arose out of an agreement made in 1947 between Lord Cranborn, the leader of the Conservative peers in the House of Lords, and Viscount Addison, who was the leader of the House of Lords, that is, the leader of the government benches in the House of Lords. Cranborn later became the fifth Marquess of Salisbury, which is why we talk about the Salisbury Addison Convention and not the Cranborn Addison Convention. As I shall discuss, the convention was not a brand new creation, but developed out of an earlier understanding of the role and function of the House of Lords, which was in fact associated with Lord Cranborn's grandfather, the third Marquess of Salisbury. The Salisbury Addison Convention at first seems to have a democratic justification, but as I shall argue, Seen in its proper context, the Convention is a partial exception to an overall understanding of the role of the Second Chamber, which is undemocratic, or perhaps more accurately stated, non-majoritarian. The political context of this agreement between Cranborn and Addison was that Britain had in 1945 for the first time returned a majority Labour government. Clement Attlee's Labour Party had won a landslide and it had done so on the basis of a party platform that included such measures as the nationalisation of the coal and steel industries, nationalisation of the railway network, and the creation of a national health service, amongst other socialist policies. The dilemma facing the Conservative peers was this. As the more numerous party in the House of Lords, the Conservatives had the strength of numbers to block every one of the Labour Party's bills, but such an obstructionist stance risked undermining the fragile legitimacy of the House of Lords, perhaps even to the point of provoking unrest in the country, and obstruction risked provoking the Labour government and the Commons to use its majority to restrict the powers of the House of Lords, if necessary by using the Parliament Act 1911. The House of Commons did in fact do this, as, as you will have seen from my video on the Parliament Act, although the restrictions were arguably modest and certainly less than they might have been. So by reaching an agreement with a smaller contingent of Labour peers, the Conservative peers in the Lords may have preserved their own institutional position. As Cranborn told the House of Lords, Whatever our personal views, we should frankly recognise that these proposals were put before the country at the recent general election, and that the people of this country, with full knowledge of these proposals, returned the Labour Party to power. The government may, therefore, I think, fairly claim that they have a mandate to introduce these proposals. I believe that it would be constitutionally wrong when the country has so recently expressed its views, for this House to oppose proposals which have been definitely put before the electorate. So, at one level, the Salisbury Addison Convention had its origins in a pragmatic response to a carefully balanced political situation. But there are deeper questions to be asked in terms of why, constitutionally speaking, was this an acceptable pragmatic response? in terms of existing understandings of the relationship between the Commons and Lords. I will come to that, but first we should consider what the Salisbury Addison Convention actually requires. A modern statement of the Convention can be found in paragraph 4.21 of the Wakeham Report, the report on the Royal Commission on the House of Lords which reported in the year 2000. It tells us that the convention amounts to an understanding that a manifesto bill, foreshadowed in the governing party's most recent election manifesto and passed by the House of Commons, should not be opposed by the second chamber on second or third reading. This convention has sometimes been extended to cover wrecking amendments which destroy or alter beyond recognition such a bill. The glossary to the cabinet manual spells things out a little further. It says that by operation of the Salisbury Addison Convention, a manifesto bill is accorded a second reading 
is not subject to wrecking amendments which change the government's manifesto intention as promised in the bill and is passed and sent or returned to the House of Commons so that they have the opportunity in reasonable time to consider the bill or any amendments which the House of Lords may wish to propose. In short, the Salisbury Addison Convention is a convention that places a restriction on whether and to what extent the House of Lords can legitimately oppose legislation sent to it by the House of Commons. Unlike the Parliament Acts, it doesn't formally limit the power of the House of Lords but it does, as a matter of convention, state circumstances in which the Lords ought to desist from using its legal powers. So what then is the function of the Salisbury Addison Convention? It might at first appear that the Convention has a democratic, or more precisely a majoritarian, justification. On the face of things, it seems to suggest that legislation that has an explicit democratic mandate of having been put to the people in an election should be immune from being overturned by the non-elected Chamber of Parliament. The problem with that interpretation, in my opinion, is that the Convention is in fact an exception to normal practice, which is that the non-elected House of Lords can reject any other legislation which is not covered by the Salisbury Convention because it was never foreshadowed by the governing party's manifesto. Another way of looking at the Convention would be to see it as anti-majoritarian because it imposes a formal condition, inclusion of the measure in a manifesto, which a popularly elected majority in the House of Commons must comply with in order to have its legislation enacted into law. The Salisbury Convention is thus fundamentally conservative. Its effect is to preserve the status quo by making it harder for a government to claim a popular mandate for changes it seeks to enact. And the condition itself, inclusion in a manifesto, might be seen as arbitrary from the point of view of democracy. Manifesto commitments are rarely precise statements of legislative policy, and they aren't widely read by voters, who in any case will more than likely base their voting decisions on any number of grounds, not just the content of the party manifesto. So the idea that manifesto commitments have some kind of popular backing is, if we are honest, a fiction. In my view, we should see the Salisbury Addison Convention as part of the broader understandings of what the House of Lords is for. In other words, its function. And we can see this most clearly by looking at the way the constitutional understanding of that function has changed over the years, often as the constitution has changed in other ways too. To see how this is the case, we might trace the role of the House of Lords through successive periods. In the 19th century, up until the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, we can see the role of the House of Lords as guardians of the status quo. They enjoyed a general constitutional power, and indeed as they saw it, a political duty, to reject fundamental changes. The Corn Law debates of the 1830s and 40s was the high watermark of this approach, but the defeat of the Conservative peers over the Corn Laws demonstrated that this was not a power the Lords could, as a matter of political practice, continue to exercise. The House of Lords had to change the way it saw its role, and under the remarkable guidance of the Duke of Wellington, it did so. As the 19th century constitutional commentator Walter Badgett put it, it is the sole claim of the Duke of Wellington to the name of a statesman that he presided over this change. He wished to guide the Lords to their true position, and he did guide them. What was this true position as Lord Wellington saw it? In the case of the Corn Laws, he advised them, as he put it in a letter to Lord Derby, to vote that which would most tend to public order and would be most beneficial to the immediate interests of the country. Not to block fundamental change, but to guide and channel it and to maintain the legitimacy of the House of Lords so as to prevent revolution, which was a real fear at certain points in the 19th century. And so, in the period following the repeal of the Corn Laws, a new understanding emerged of the way in which the power of the House of Lords should be exercised. 
The point of the House of Lords veto this new way of thinking suggested was to allow the country as a whole to consider or reconsider any legislative proposals of the House of Commons that would result in fundamental change. On this understanding, if the House of Commons object to the Lord's veto, the Prime Minister could call an election to seek a mandate for change, and according to this theory, the House of Lords would then acquiesce to the legislation, at least eventually. As Badgett put it, the House of Lords had changed from a body opposing fundamental change to become a revising and suspending house. As he put it, it can alter bills, it can reject bills on which the House of Commons is not yet thoroughly in earnest, upon which the nation is not yet determined. Their veto is a sort of hypothetical veto. They say, we reject your bill for this once or these twice or even these thrice. But if you keep on sending it up, at last we won't reject it. The House has ceased to be one of the latent directors and has become one of temporary rejectors and palpable alterers. This idea became known as the Salisbury Doctrine because over the last three decades or so of the 19th century, it was developed into a constitutional philosophy by none other than the third Marquess of Salisbury, the grandfather of the fifth Marquess, who, as I mentioned, was one of the authors of the post-war Salisbury Addison Convention. It is sometimes also known as the referendum theory, because the role of the House of Lords was, in effect, to trigger an election, which would then be contested on the merits of the legislative proposals emanating from the House of Commons. This was a time of fundamental upheaval in Britain, and the role of the House of Lords on the referendum theory was to ensure that radical system-altering changes would only become law if they formed part of what Lord Salisbury called the firm, deliberate and sustained conviction of the British people. It's important to note, I think, that this was the period in which what we now call executive dominance in the House of Commons was taking shape. So by exercising its powers in this manner, the House of Lords was in effect acting as a defender of the rights of Parliament against an ascendant executive. As William Sharp McKechnie put it in 1908, we are at this point in the story just a year ahead of the constitutional crisis that led to the Parliament Act 1911. As McKechnie put it, the House of Lords, which once stood guard over the actions of a too powerful House of Commons, now stands guard over a too powerful cabinet. The Parliament Acts, of course, limited the formal powers of the House of Lords, as you will know if you have watched my video on the topic. But it can be argued that the thrust of these reforms were sympathetic with, rather than contrary to, the idea of Parliament as a delaying and revising chamber, Badgett's chamber of temporary rejectors and palpable alterers. From the 1911 Act onwards, the House of Lords no longer had even the formal power to delay a bill indefinitely. It couldn't use that power to have matters put to the people as the referendum theory suggested, unless the legislation was introduced towards the end of the Parliament. What you could say is that it enjoyed the constitutional power to refer any proposal back to the government by rejecting or amending it, even to the point of wrecking. But this was no more than a power to request a review. If the government insisted on its policy, the Parliament Act 1911 meant the Commons would prevail in time, even without going to the people in an election. But the Parliament Act 1949, when it passed, reinforced this position. Which brings me back to Lord Cranborne, later the fifth Marquess of Salisbury. Seen in the light of what went before, and of the legislative changes to the power of the Lords as a result of the Parliament Act, the Salisbury-Addison Convention of 1947 can be seen as an adaptation of the long-standing Salisbury Doctrine. With a Labour government having been returned on the basis of a radical agenda, and prepared, if necessary, to challenge the powers of the House of Lords, the young Cranborn gave a pragmatic answer as to how the Lords would exercise its power to refer matters back to the government for a second opinion. Without the power to insist that the matter should be put to the people, 
he had to find some other benchmark for judging whether it formed part of the firm, del deliberate and sustained conviction, as his grandfather had put it. Cranborn was in effect saying that conservative peers would take Labour's manifesto commitment as probative of the settled will of the public, while remaining unencumbered to oppose measures which had not been put to the public in this way. That, roughly, remains the position today, as you will see from reading the 2017 House of Lords Constitution Select Committee report, the Salisbury Addison Convention. A key issue that the report addressed was whether the convention applied or should apply in a hung parliament, that is, a parliament in which no one party enjoys an overall majority in the House of Commons. I won't address this here, but having heard what I have said generally, you might want to reflect on your own views on that question. There is certainly room for disagreement. So, I hope you have enjoyed this video, and I hope you have gained a number of things from it. By explaining the history of the Salisbury Addison Convention, and placing it in the context of broader ideas about the role and function of the House of Lords, I hope I have given you a better understanding of the constitutional underpinnings of the Convention. I have argued that the justification for the Salisbury Convention, far from resting on democratic principle, is in fact related to a justification for the role of the House of Lords that is concerned with the limits of the powers that should be enjoyed by democratic majorities. This, of course, does not settle the question as to whether the powers and functions of the House of Lords are justifiable or not. I expect many of you will have strong views on that. But I do hope that, as a result of watching this video, you will be better informed and in a better place to articulate your own view. I'll see you in a later video.